Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, here uh, we want to uh, introduce another uh, speaker. So he's uh, David from Approval. So he will talk about uh, more on the user uh, uh, identity. So uh, 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 David, are you ready? Hello, uh, David, I think you are on mute. Of course I am. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah, now your, your voice is loud and clear. So maybe okay. you, try, you can try to share the screen first. Okay, it's all good. Okay, so let me pass the time to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so my name is David Stewart. I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of Approve. I'm going to talk a bit about Approve later on. Um, what um, I want to talk about today is uh, user identity verification and um, why it's not enough to protect mobile-centric businesses. And I'm going to explain why I'm talking about mobile specifically uh, in a moment too. Um, now, I really was uh, quite interested in the kind of fintech um, th uh, theme of the of the event, and um, so that that will that will run through the presentation as well. And because this is the last presentation of the whole two day event, um, I want to congratulate you all on uh, on making it this far. And as a result, I've got a special offer for you at the end of the presentation. So if you can make it there, um, that will be great. I'm also fortunate in that many of the previous speakers have covered a lot of the basic stuff about what happens to APIs. So I don't need to go through this and I can, I can um, concentrate on, uh, on some other material. Um, the, the, the bottom line of APIs is if there's a way to attack, abuse, hack um, APIs, then people will do it. So if you're an emerging FinTech and you're thinking, well, we're too small, nobody's really interested in us, um, nobody will, will mess around with our APIs. Uh, you're wrong. If they can do it, they will. Um, and there are many examples of this. And again, I, I don't need to go through the many um, examples of things that have gone wrong um, because you're probably very familiar with them. And, and FinTech uh, and financial services is a particular target for uh, API attacks of various kinds. The one on the right-hand side, which is uh, some researchers at IBM, um, actually is very interesting because it, it plays to the point I'm talking about. There, they uncovered a large uh, hacking machine uh, targeted at financial services, which was routinely and automatically um, uh, circumventing uh, user authentication solutions, uh, which were intended to prevent uh, those kinds of attacks, including two-factor authentication. So intercepting SMSs and uh, you know all of that stuff. So um, you might be interested in, in that. But the point I'm trying to make is that user authentication is of course a useful and good thing to do, but it is not sufficient uh, by itself. So let's look first of all at a typical enterprise view of protecting APIs. And as, as I mentioned, I'm gonna use mobile uh, as an example. The typical view is, well, we need to put in place something to uh, authenticate the user. And we need to put in place something that protects the service that we provide in the back end. And in between, we've got an API, and we need to uh, make sure that it's, uh, it's, it's encrypted and secure. And if we do all those things, uh, we, we check the user, we check that there's some kind of access credential, like an API key that's needed to use the API. And then we've got you know, standard um, protections at the, at the network entry point. Then um, we're all good, and we can launch. Um, well, pro the, the, um, the situation is a little bit more complicated than that. And, uh, and I want to share with you in this presentation some of our experiences and expertise, because this is the world that we, uh, we live in. Now, I mentioned that mobile is a specific case and actually uh, is the most difficult uh, API to protect for a couple of reasons. Number one is that the app can be downloaded by anyone and um, you don't know who has it and you don't know what they're doing with it. So they can spend a lot of time studying and reverse engineering it and uh, preparing to, to attack the API. The second thing, which is a little bit more um, subtle, is that quite often uh, APIs that service mobile apps are very rich, meaning that they can extract um, large amounts of data uh, from the backend systems quite quickly. But the app, when it's in place, actually is like a, it's, like, it's almost like a rate limiter. So um, because the app can only do certain things at certain rates, and you know, there's usually, there probably will be only one user logged in at any one time, it limits what you can actually do uh, with the API. 
As soon as you take the app away, if you attach a, a botnet or script to the API and it's able to access the backend, you'll find uh, in, in many cases that uh, data can be extracted at, at quite an alarming rate. So these are, these are two things that make the mobile situation um, uh, quite special. So let's look, turn it around now and look at it from the fraudsters, hackers, um, abusers a view, and how, how do they look at attacking APIs? Well, the first thing they do is a lot of research and digging into things, trying to understand how your, uh, how your platform works. They'll look at the mobile app, they'll reverse engineer it um, or attempt to, they will, and they might be doing that in order to modify, tamper, repackage the app. Maybe they'll create a version of the app and try and get it up into the app stores. Maybe they want to be in a position to manipulate the data that's in the app to, to make it do something different than what was expected. Or the most common reason that they reverse engineer is simply to understand the app. Because what they're going to do is they're going to create a script which impersonates the app traffic as far as the API is concerned, bypasses the app, and, um, and tries to connect to the backend service via the API using traffic that looks exactly like the app. The second thing to look at is the device itself, because by installing the app on a uh, modified uh, or emulated simulated uh, device, they might be able to uh, get a deeper insight into uh, what's going on under the hood and then the operating system and manipulate the operating system to give them access to things that they wouldn't normally be able to get access to. And there's a huge range of um, hacking tools they're called or instrumentation frameworks, um, things like Exposed and Frida and so on that are free, uh, available to anyone and um, are very, very effective at doing this kind of work. So um, those are the kinds of um, resources that, uh, that your adversaries have, have access to. And the final thing to look at, of course, is the API channel itself. A man in the middle, or I'm being very politically correct here and talking about a person in the middle, um, because it may not be a man, and uh, so who's, who's basically sitting in the traffic, looking at what's passing, maybe um, modifying the, uh, the payloads, et cetera. They'll also be looking at um, decrypting uh, your uh, TLS channel. If you're pinning the connections, which you should be, they will also look to see if they can unpin those connections so they can gain access to the traffic. And finally, of course, as I mentioned, they will be preparing and testing scripts that attach to the API to see if they can find their way into your backend services. Remember that the, 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 juicy, the juicy data, the juicy information is all in the backend service. It's not generally in the app. Um, that's where the big amounts of data is. So that's really the target of the bad guys. Um, so if they can bypass the app, get access to your backend systems, that will be, uh, that will be fine as far as they're concerned. So what we end up with is we thought we had a couple of attack surfaces to worry about, the user credentials and user authentication and the backend systems, but it turns out that we have five and we need to consider all of these and we need to think about how we're going to uh, protect them. So um, before getting into what we do about that, just another important point is that there's two different API attacks that can be, uh, that can be executed here. And, and this was touched on um, by some of the previous speakers as well. One of them, and the most common one that people talk about, is vulnerabilities and flaws in the APIs and how they can be exploited by attackers to gain access to the back end. And that is an absolutely key um, vector that they can use. But there's another one. And the other one is not using, uh, not exposing a vulnerability and, and using that, but simply automating the API traffic, impersonating the remote client, whether it's a web page, whether it's an IoT device, whether it's a mobile app, impersonating that traffic. And that is one of the most difficult things to detect because it's, it's presenting itself with valid credentials. It's looking exactly like regular, genuine, good API traffic, but it isn't. So, uh, and it's not making use of a vulnerability that you may or may not have in your API. So um, you need to think about those two different types of what would happen if somebody presented a script which, um, which had uh, correctly formed API protocol and it had uh, um, user, or user credentials and API keys that were valid, would you be able to detect that? Again, previous speakers have covered this. Um, there's two approaches to protecting your APIs. One is to shift left, so, so 
try to get the vulnerabilities out of your APIs, make sure there's no bugs and flaws in there. That's all a good thing to do. And I'm not going to talk about that today. But you also need to shield write, we call it. And shield write means that you need to uh, shield and protect the APIs when they're deployed. And if you think about it, this is a very sensible thing to do together because if you can shield your APIs against, um, for example, scripted attacks, then it means that any vulnerabilities that you might have in your APIs are protected. And it means that you um, they can't be exploited because they're typically exploited by a script, which is which finds the vulnerability and then is able to work its way through that. If you're blocking scripts, then um, you've got more time uh, to make sure that your vulnerabilities are taken care of over time, but your, your business is protected in the meantime. So the shield right is something you should consider doing immediately. And the shift left is something that you should absolutely do as well, but it, it takes the pressure off uh, getting that fixed in the short term. So looking at how you might shield uh, those extra three uh, surfaces, and the answer is there's, there's a variety of different things which, which cover bits, of, bits and pieces of it, uh, and no holistic solution here. So there's, there's app shielding that might protect the app or make it more difficult to reverse engineer. There's device fingerprinting, which might allow you to tie a, a specific device to a specific app instance. And then there's the API traffic analysis that might detect when you know certain um, anomalous behavior is going on within the, the app traffic, but none of them protects the whole, the whole picture. So when we uh, were sitting in a conference room about six years ago and thinking about what turned out to be approved, this was the kind of idea that we, we came up with. What would happen if you could verify with certainty that each API call came from a genuine untampered mobile app instance and that the app was running in a safe device environment? Now, if you could do that, then it would mean that you could block, that means that anything that couldn't prove that it was a genuine untampered mobile app instance running in a safe environment could be blocked. And the advantage of doing that, even if they present valid user credentials, is that you get that second or, or additional factor um, that is independent of whatever you're doing on the user authentication side. So you're, you're, you're authenticating the user but you're also um, authenticating the remote software that the user is using to make the API request. And if you can do that, then it means that any scripts or anything else, even if they have access to valid credentials, uh, can be blocked. So it's a positive security model. Uh, it runs alongside, which is the same as user authentication. It doesn't have false positives. You can shield um, the exploitation of any uh, uh, vulnerabilities, both ones you know about, ones you don't know about um, in the uh, in the APIs. And it means you're blocking bad traffic at the edge. So that, what that means is you're not even processing it. And if you think about it, it doesn't make sense. Why would you process traffic that you can identify as not coming from a genuine mobile app instance? It doesn't make sense. You, you wouldn't take it into your backend system and, and process it and analyze it and try to decide whether it's good or not. If it's not coming from the app, it's not good. So just block it. So that's what Approve is all about. And I'm just in the last few minutes I've got here, I'm just going to introduce it to you at a very high level. And uh, a lot of this stuff is on our website. Be very happy to talk to you about uh, how it might work within your, your environment too. So um, the basic idea is it's like uh, when the app launches, it communicates with the Approve Cloud Service and requests to be authenticated. There is a we call it sometimes a DNA test that's run, um, some clever stuff in there that actually verifies the app. If the app is genuine, it gets a very short lifetime token given to it, which it puts into the API header that gets sent to your backend where you can check the token. And that's the basic high level concept of, uh, of what it does. Now, um, obviously, uh, there are a couple of important things about what it does, and that is that the SDK that's in the app it contains no secrets, so there's nothing in there that can be used against it. The, the approved cloud service actually does all the uh, all the clever, all the clever stuff. So um, we're not giving the the bad guys anything in the app, assuming they could get access to it um, that would be useful to them. Approve is used in a whole range of uh, uh, application areas, um, from fintech to um, robots to healthcare to gaming to retail to automotive to social media, etc. Um, so a lot of different mobile-centric um, uh, 
uh, businesses uh, use it because it's a, a simple way to identify that, um, differentiate between traffic that's coming from genuine app instances and the rest. And you really, you really aren't interested in the rest of that traffic. You really just want to block it. Since we're talking fintech today, Papra is um, is a fast-growing Turkish fintech. Uh, they have been very successful. Been working with them for over three years. They are um, probably worth thousands of users a month when we first started working with them. They're in the millions now. Have grown very quickly. But what they saw was as they started to grow was they were attracting a lot of uh, automated traffic, probing the APIs, trying to figure out if there's a way in, there's a way to do things that shouldn't be allowed, et cetera. Um, and even if they weren't necessarily being successful, they were burning um, cloud costs because all of that traffic has to be processed somewhere. And so, um, you know, some of it might be doing fraudulent things, but some of it just might be messing around, but still you have to pay for it. Every CPU you operating in your, in your cloud instance, um, every API transaction you process costs you money. So um, by blocking these at the edge, they were very quickly able to see a significant drop in their uh, operating costs. Um, and, uh, and that helps to balance their business. And so there's a success story in, in detail um, on our website, if you want to read all about uh, Papara and what they, were, what, what they experienced. So the concept, and again, I won't go into this in, in a lot of detail, the concept is that um, there's an SDK that goes in the app. It just drops in and you call it. It really is a, a simple thing because you don't have to do anything. It manages, it manages the whole process. It communicates with the approved cloud service. Um, every five minutes, we re-authenticate the app to make sure it's present, hasn't been, hasn't been modified, and is working in a safe environment. And uh, finally, um, the, uh, we're not sitting in the middle of your traffic. So this will be invisible to your users. It takes a very short period of time to do the authentication um, and uh, your users won't know it's there. So it's completely invisible to them. In addition to verifying the app, we also do a whole bunch of uh, environmental checks within your runtime. And um, this is uh, important because um, we want to allow you to have the control over the security policies within your uh, within your app itself, or within your platform. So these are all the things we detect, and then you pick, you choose a security policy based on this. So you can pick um, what things you're prepared to accept and what things you're not prepared to accept, um, and you can change that uh, as often as you want. You don't have to reissue an app to uh, to update those security policies. Um, I mentioned before that you should be pinning your connections. Um, if you're not, then uh, the good news for you is that it's built into Approve. So you can actually um, get pinning for free, if you like, if you're using Approve. And uh, if you're worried about maintaining and managing uh, certificates, then uh, that is something you can do automatically or instantly, I should say, over the air, because we, um, we have a, a, an ability to upload those to directly to the apps, again, without you having to issue a new app and put it through the app store, et cetera. So it's a very uh, elegant solution, in fact. And finally, you get a whole load of um, dashboard analytics uh, from, uh, from the solution. So you can see uh, you know, the number of who's using how much Android, how much iOS. You can see what versions are being used. You, on, the, on the failure side, you can see what kind of things are being rejected. So you can see all the different flags that we have and, and, and what kind of rejection counts you've got. So you can see what kind of attacks are going on. And, and you can use this to adjust the security policies that you have within your platform. So um, in summary, um, the things I'd like you to take away from this is that uh, the servicing API servicing mobile apps are, in fact, the hardest to protect. You probably knew this already, but just to make sure. Secondly, that you, you really need to think about these four, these five attack surfaces, not just the user and the, and the backend system, but the, the three ones in between. The shift left and shield right is, a, is an important concept to, to get across. And I encourage you to look at adding that shielding uh, as soon as possible. It's a great thing to add early on uh, in, your, in the development of your business because um, the, the uh, attackers, fraudsters, whatever you want to call them, are efficient and uh, if if they hit if they have a problem and it's not easy for them to gain access to your api they'll go somewhere else uh, where where the api is easier to 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 use um, so putting in the shielding early on uh, will be a benefit to you 
and think about operating costs. Don't just think about you know the security and what you're trying to block. Think about operating costs and where you want to 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 do that blocking. Um, think about security as an onion. Here we have an onion. It's a slightly evil looking onion, um, but there you have um, the idea of different layers, and 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 you should consider that and think about what layers you need to apply and when. So finally, uh, I promised you a, a special offer. Um, this is uh, obviously we have a free free trial, which is open to everybody. But um, what we're uh, doing at the moment, and what we will do for for the first five people who sign up from uh, from this event, is give you uh, access to um, the free pre-deployment checklist, and which is something we normally charge for. And, and this is uh, getting in front of one of our experts who will review all of your um, security policies, implementations, uh, how you've done the testing, go through sort of common uh, issues and make sure everything's great before you before you deploy. Uh, typically, uh, when people deploy, they see uh, 10 to 15% of the traffic on their APIs is not coming from genuine app instances. So that's quite a significant bit of cost that you can get rid of uh, quite quickly. So to gain access to this, um, this deal, um, just when you sign up, there's a, any other information box, just put API Day Singapore in the box and um, we'll make sure that you, you get that uh, pre-deployment checklist. And my email address is there too. I'd be very happy to talk to uh, any of you um, about any of the stuff that I've uh, presented today. Thanks a lot. Okay, let me, let me unmute. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks, okay. Derek. Okay, so this is my, my turn. <laughs> okay, so, um, yep. So, uh, David, uh, so thanks for sharing. So, uh, maybe just uh, one, one very quick question. So, you have been in the, in the, in the field for quite a long time, especially on the, uh, okay, you, you mentioned about user identity is not enough. Can you share maybe one or two examples that you feel really uh, 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 impactful? And then, okay, maybe because a company only rely on user identity and what is the, the, the impact or, or maybe the, the outcome that you can see. And then try to, can, can you share some interesting story about that one or some uh, yeah. terrible story about that one? Yeah, I mean, the thing about user user authentication and, and please don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying you shouldn't do user authentication. You absolutely should. It's a, it's a key part of the of the journey. But, um, you know, and it's, it's interesting that quite often when people talk about API usage, they, they use the expression, you need to know who's using your API, right? And, and that's because that's how they think about the security problem. And they think that if you identify who is using it, then um, you're all good. But what I'm saying is in addition to identifying who, you also need to identify what. And the what is you know, what software um, you know, client is using the the uh, the API as well as the user. Now, the thing about user authentication is that it it's a kind of um, initially it's it's a one time uh, check. So, if you're thinking about biometrics, if you're thinking about you know a user login, you do that at the beginning of your session, and then a you know under the hood, some kind of token will probably be uh, be uh, uh, created, and that token will have a relatively long lifetime. Even by relatively mm -hmm. long, I mean maybe hours, sometimes it's days, but maybe hours. So that means that if somebody's able to intercept that token, um, they've got you know, hours of uh, activity that they can, they can carry on using the, the persona of that, uh, that logged in person, if you like, to, to be able to, to do things on the API. So it's an important thing, but um, the, the, the sort of, um, it's a one-time, it's a one-time login thing, and even though there's 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 things like uh, access token refreshing and all the rest of it, but still the the kind of lifetime of these tokens is quite long compared to the um, what you can do with a script. So our our tokens are, as I mentioned in the presentations, five minutes long. So that's 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 from a security point of view, you need to be refreshing things very very rapidly and very often. But in the user authentication world, things are a little bit more slow, and that creates an opportunity for for the bad guys. Okay, thank you. Thanks also for your extended sharing. So uh, it's more, almost time, and then uh, thanks every uh, audience to stay in their contents for long, and also thanks again, Derek. So uh, I think we are uh, closing. Uh, we are come. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to the closing remarks. So maybe okay. So let let us have okay. Thanks for Derek's time. So bye bye. Okay.